Hey folks, I'm Brown Bear. This is the fourth in a 10-part design commentary series on competitive StarCraft II. If you missed the previous parts, I recommend you watch them before watching this video. For clarity's sake, anytime you hear the word StarCraft, I mean StarCraft II. If I'm referencing Brood War, I'll just call it Brood War. Finally, I recommend that you watch this video from beginning to end. However, for the convenience of folks who prefer to jump around, I've provided timestamps to major talking points in the description below. I'd like to start today by discussing art style. StarCraft II's distinct graphical work complements its design focus on electronic sports. In a 2011 technical talk, Alan Dillon, the lead artist on StarCraft II, described the four tenets of Blizzard's art style. Epic ideas, bold shapes, crisp and colorful textures, and dynamic animations. It's noteworthy that the concept of clarity appears twice, first in the emphasis on bold and visible silhouettes, and second in the definition of texture design. This points to the critical role of basic visibility and contrast. The artists aim to make it as easy as possible for players to quickly identify what's on their screen. In a game where competitors will switch from location to location every few seconds, that really matters. These design choices become particularly noticeable when you pull up a more traditional game. On your screen I've placed a screenshot from a more recent and less esportsy RTS, Dawn of War 3. Dawn of War is famous for its art style, in fact I'd argue it's one of its primary selling points given that the franchise has its origins in a tabletop war game. There's a lot to love in this picture, but it's obvious that clarity was not a priority. The smoke and lighting effects create a blurry effect on the screen. In addition, the units blend in with the background, and the different color palettes seem to mix together. I'll emphasize again that this is not a criticism of Dawn of War. I make the comparison only to point out the unique considerations that come into play when you're building an eSport. Mr. Dilling made a very interesting observation in his talk concerning specular highlights. If you're not familiar with this concept, it refers to the bright spots that appear on shiny objects when they're directly illuminated. I've put an example up on your screen. Mr. Dilling pointed out that the artists carefully considered the angles on their model designs to ensure that the specular highlights produced by the lighting engine would enable units to pop more visibly. He pointed to the Warhound as a particularly good example. As a former Age of Empires player, this philosophy really stuck out to me when I went back and watched footage of Age of Empires 3. The lighting engine in that game featured a unique kind of bloom effect. From an art perspective, this was really cool. I've actually never encountered another game that managed to create this surreal kind of historic but also modern look to it. The downside from an esports perspective is that it's a little harder to differentiate different items on the screen. One of the interesting decisions on the animation side was the choice to give units a random attack delay. This prevents units from firing in unison. You can see an example on the screen in front of you. Even though the marines begin attacking simultaneously, by the end they're all firing at different times. Personally I'm skeptical that this has any impact on the gameplay, and I tend to think about it more as an artistic choice. Another interesting anecdote is the influence the art team had on the game's design. Mr. Dilling describes two examples, the Thor and the Hellbat, where the artistic work was actually done first and the design work second. Here's what he had to say about the Thor specifically. Other times, we actually get stuff in that seems cool to us and we're like, hey, we want a giant robot in the game. The Thor is a great example. We went to the designers and said, hey, giant robot, it's got huge guns. They're like, what does it do? I said, I don't know, you guys figure it out. It's just cool. Who doesn't like giant robots? So that's a good example of basically them putting in cool stuff on our side and making it work in the game really well with the mechanics. The artists wanted to include something in the game, so the game's designers designed mechanics to make it work. This had some serious gameplay implications. In fact, the existence of the Thor is one of the reasons there's no Goliath equivalent in StarCraft II, to the great chagrin of most Terran mech players. This might seem like a bad thing. How can it make sense to subordinate core design decisions to the art style? Personally, I take a fairly optimistic approach to moments like this one. Ultimately, games are products that get built by people. They are what their creators want them to be, not necessarily what they quote unquote should be. In fact, what they should be and what they are is precisely the same. That's just the nature of creative works. If the development team on StarCraft wanted to build an eSport that featured giant robots, then it's their prerogative to make that work, regardless of the implications for the underlying design. In fact, I adopt the same view in a much broader sense as well. I try not to decouple any aspect of the game from the nuts and bolts of the creative process. One of the features that sticks out to me is the recent quit and rewind introduced to the competitive ladder. This enables players to jump into a replay immediately after the end of a game. 
We mentioned last time that the replay viewer is a pretty niche feature, given that most players don't play multiplayer. Watching a replay immediately after a game is like a niche within a niche. Personally, I don't think these kinds of features would exist if the team was doing what it quote unquote should be doing. The more I learn about StarCraft, the more it comes across to me like a labor of love more than anything else. I'm honestly not sure what it would look like if the development team lost that level of creative freedom. It'd be hard to discuss the art style without also talking about the game engine. Arguably the most important choice here was the decision to go three-dimensional. From a development perspective, Blizzard had already developed expertise working in 3D from the development of Warcraft 3. One of the learnings from that game was the importance of build stability. Whereas StarCraft 1 only became stably playable when it entered beta, the Warcraft 3 team attempted to make daily builds playable from the very early days of development. This mattered because of the company's inexperience in developing three-dimensional games. With something like a 3D model, it's a lot harder to tell what it will look like in-engine when compared with something like a two-dimensional sprite. Also interesting was what the company learned about the camera. The team experimented with different perspectives before returning to the isometric approach that would ship with Warcraft 3. Here's Rob Pardo describing the process. With 3D, we decided to bring the camera down quite a bit and try out some things. The problem was, with the camera pulled all the way down, it became a pseudo third-person experience. It was disorienting when you went around the map, and it was difficult to select units in battle because your camera frustum was pointed in one direction, so you didn't have a good view of the battlefield. It was a challenge because we still wanted a fun strategy game. Eventually, we pulled the camera into a more traditional isometric view, and that's when we really started making progress. Mr. Pardo lays out the timeline of events more explicitly later in the same interview. So once we had the art and the actual 3D engine in there, that's when we actually started messing with the camera, messing with the units, trying to figure out exactly what kind of game we wanted to make for War 3. The decision to build a 3D engine was made first, and an isometric camera was adopted only when the team realized that that was the only workable way to build an effective strategy game. I'd be really interested to know whether the developers would have gone 3D anyway had they known the gameplay would end up logically two-dimensional. I suppose you could argue that the mere existence of StarCraft II provides an answer to that question, given that they repeated the same design decisions. 3D is an important design choice because of its gameplay impact. On your screen, I've put an image of several rows of tanks. At first glance, this looks perfectly normal, visually and logically two-dimensional, just like you'd expect. However, the world is physically 3D. If we draw two vertical straight lines, you can see this for yourself. The tanks in the bottom row are literally larger than the tanks in the top row, at least in graphical terms, in both 16x9 and 4x3 screen resolutions. This happens because the game world is three-dimensional and curved. If you think of our camera as pointing at a sphere instead of a two-dimensional plane, it all makes perfect sense. The tanks on the top row are literally further away than the tanks in the middle, since that's where the camera is pointing. As a result, the closer objects appear larger, and the further away objects appear smaller. This extends to the mouse as well. While the cursor is logically two-dimensional, the game world is physically three-dimensional. That means the cursor's distance from another object depends on the location of the camera. I put together this example because one of my friends always makes fun of me for messing up my sim city as Terran. Here I'm trying to place a barracks next to my first supply depot, and I'm trying to find the point at which my barracks doesn't land at the right spot. When this is happening at the top of my screen, the point of no return is here. When this is happening in the middle of my screen, the point of no return is here. The screenshots in front of you were taken at 1024 by 768 screen resolution. The distance between the supply depot and the point of no return when the camera is at the top of the screen is around 60 pixels. In the middle, around 40 pixels. Every time a new map pool comes out, I screw up my building placements a bunch of times before finally nailing it down. I never understood why this was until I did this exercise. The way to consistently place buildings is to use the map textures as a reference. As long as your cursor is on the same map location, it'll always place a building in the same spot, regardless of where your camera is pointing. Anytime a new map comes out, I'm not as familiar with the textures, so I instead place buildings relative to other buildings, which as we just demonstrated is inherently error prone. A more fun and perhaps impactful example is the relative positions of flying and ground units. Here I've got three Vikings flying above a tank. Can you guess which one is closest to its counterpart on the ground? Trick question, they're all the same Viking. The camera was just pointed in different places. Effects like this make a number of flying ground interactions, particularly marine tank standoffs in TVT, a lot more tense. 
Players want to pick off Vikings with their Marines to defend their medevacs, but it's difficult to visually judge how far the Vikings need to come out before you can safely attack them and not get hit by tank fire. One of the comments that routinely comes up in discussions of 3D RTS is that they feel harder to control. I think this can be explained by the curvature of the game world, which causes the effects demonstrated here. Units in your visual field will have a different physical size and apparent position depending on where they're located on the screen. This will affect the precision of your control until you've gotten used to the effect. I'm guessing that more casual players may never play the game enough to truly resolve this, and as a result will end up feeling like there's something about the engine that makes the controls feel inaccurate. For what it's worth, all these examples highlight the utility of location hotkeys. Because they're consistent from game to game, you build muscle memory much faster because there's a lot less deviation in where you need to click. I always wondered why high level players take the time to fix their location bindings the moment they place a command center. I thought maybe they were just bored. As it turns out, there's a compelling gameplay reason to do so. The last thing I wanted to mention about the graphics is the sophistication of the lighting engine. StarCraft II uses a technique called deferred rendering for much of the lighting, which allows the performance to scale with the screen resolution instead of the number of light sources. To be perfectly honest, I spent quite a lot of time researching this and still feel pretty out of my depth, so I'm not going to try to explain how this works, or discuss the gameplay implications. Instead, I just want to focus on the result, which I think is really cool. Take a look at how the light generated by the Marines' gunshots reflect off of the SCV model. Alrighty. We'll continue this train of thought in a future series when we talk about the campaign. In particular, the technical advances in the graphical engine enabled full-blown video renderings of story segments rather than the text and voice-based approach of Brood War. This has design implications with regard to narrative density, another fun example of technical details affecting gameplay. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. For now, I think this is a good time to cut episode 4. Thanks for watching! Next time, we'll be diving into quality of life features. If you enjoyed this video, I'd love it if you followed me here or on Twitter and Facebook to receive regular content updates. The relevant links are in the description below. Thank you again, and see you next time.